Hi, everyone. Welcome to join the research talk session. For this session, our theme is computing for carbon negative. Microsoft made a big commitment to go carbon negative by 2030 at early last year. Since then, Microsoft Research Asia is collaborating with academic experts and industry partners to initiate a collaborative research theme called Computing for Carbon Negative. Hope to make valuable research breakthrough to contribute to ground challenge of global warming. I'm Bei Bei Shi, the Senior Research Program Manager in Microsoft Research Asia. I'm so lucky to design and implement this Computing for Carbon Negative collaborative research theme. We worked with experts and studied the whole life circle of carbon dioxide, defined three approaches for this research theme. For the first approach, it's the interdisciplinary research. We go deep into the fields and the problems of the environment science, atmospheric science, earth science, and energy science, using computer technology to make innovation to help carbon reduction and carbon neutral. For the second approach, focuses on the computing science, when you may say, Microsoft are keeping working on this, yes, but now here we emphasize the advanced algorithms, models, software, systems using less resource and less energy. In this way, computer itself can achieve low carbon and environment friendly. As we all know, the most actual carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is from the human activity. So the third approach focuses on the industry. We use innovative computer technology to help various industrial organizations to reduce and remove carbon dioxide in their business process and supply chain. So exactly today, we invite four partners Professor Zhang Xing, Professor Zhu Liu from Tsinghua University, Professor Kao Deep Mill from National University of Singapore, Professor Toro Sato from University of Tokyo, researchers Su Xing Zhen and Xin Ran Wei from Microsoft Research Asia Machine Learning Research Group to share some of the research works under this theme, including carbon resource estimation carbon sink estimation, research on scientific mechanism and of the climate change and the control mechanism of the carbon neutral. The collaborative research is ongoing. We sincerely hope more and more researchers could join us, could collaborate with us for the carbon negative, for the sustainability in the future. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Fifi Jiaxing from Tsinghua University. Uh, it's my great honor to present our recent work in Microsoft Research Summit 2021. My presentation is about mimicking the atmospheric processes of carbon dioxide with a physical informed deep neural network. Uh, before my presentation, I would like to thank my co-authors of this of work, uh, Ms. Uh, Xiao Chun Wang uh, from Tsinghua University who helped me prepare the slides, and also my colleagues from MFRA, uh, Dr. Zheng and Dr. Liu, and also Professor Li from Wuhan University and Dr. Professor Hu from University of Oklahoma. My presentation including four parts, and first I would like to introduce a little bit about the background. So we all know that the carbon dioxide has a significant impact on climate change, and it will uh, absorb the long wave radiation and heating the atmosphere and also the ground temperature. So apparently we have to do something to control the carbon dioxide and to mimic, uh, mitigate the climate change, and we need to all work together uh, across the globe. So as 
uh, probably already know that uh, our country in China we set up a very ambitious goal and uh, trying to reduce carbon dioxide, uh, which is to achieve a peak carbon by 2030 and also the carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, which means we're going to have a zero carbon emission uh, in that year. Uh, that's a very ambitious goal, and we have to uh, reduce a lot of carbon emissions uh, in, in, last, in, in the following uh, 20 or 30 years. So how we actually can uh, uh, event the control effectiveness? Actually, they have a very good product from a satellite. Uh, they could, can, can keep growing, and they provide a very good product for us to observe the carbon dioxide uh, from the space. So uh, this product have a big good opportunity to help us to track the process of CO2 controls uh, because we can provide the carbon concentration uh, for the whole globe. So, however, we have a, a remaining question because what we observed is a CO2 concentration, but we controlled the CO2 emissions. So they actually not equal with each other, which means when we emit the emission into the atmosphere, they're going to go through a series of atmospheric processes, uh, including the uh, some biogenic, uh, biogenic processes, and also we exchange uh, between the atmosphere and ocean and rainforest. A lot of processes uh, will give us a challenge. Uh, they have a big gap between the emission and the concentration. It, directly from the concentration, we actually cannot easily to estimate the emissions. So right now we have a very powerful tool to help us to simulate the CO2 concentration, which is uh, the 3D atmospheric chemistry transport model, uh, for example, the Wolfcan model. So use that model that we can simulate uh, the CO2 concentration from the emissions. Uh, we're going to couple a lot of uh, atmospheric equations, for example, the diffusion equations to represent all the atmospheric physical and chemical processes and to estimate from the time to time. Uh, they're going to go to uh, integral with the time. So the challenge is that this model is have very long uh, time consuming, which means they become very inefficient. We need a lot of uh, computer forces, uh, forces uh, to, to simulate the concentration, uh, which is not cli clearly it's not climate friendly because it's going to emit carbon dioxide itself. So how to efficiently uh, to simulate the CO2 concentration from the emission, uh, this is our task. So we want to set up a deep neural network uh, trying to mimic the Wolfcan Wolf model and try to capture the linearity uh, between the CO2 emission and the concentrations. So uh, in this study, we actually set up two types of concentration for CO2 uh, because the CO2 if, uh, have changed across the uh, vertical height. At the surface, uh, because it's close to the fourth, uh, they have really high concentration. Uh, we call it a surface concentration. And it will decline across, uh, when it's going up. Um, for the satellite observed, they usually observe the total concentration across the whole vertical, uh, that we call the column concentration. So both two concentrations are going to set up as a label for our model, and then we're going to mimic the Wolfcan model uh, to, to capture how the emission translates uh, to the concentration. So this is the, our data set. Uh, we're using all the input data for Wolfcan model, uh, which including the emission inventory uh, in, uh, for both anthropogenic and biogenic emissions, and also the meteorology data, and also the initial condition, uh, which means the period time type uh, of concentration. And use that in, information fit into the uh, new network, and also we set up the label as a concentration simulated by the Wolfcan. So the model, uh, we we're going to cover the whole China, and we're running for the whole year, and they're going to have hourly revolution, and they have very high uh, revolution for the space, uh, which is 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer. So the horizontally, we have around like uh, 400, for, uh, 14 or 13 uh, uh, thousand grid cell uh, for, to, uh, to train in the model. So basically, this is the uh, network structure we designed. Uh, we use ResNet model uh, as our uh, new network. And then we fit into the model as a, 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 all the favor, including the initial condition, flux factor. Uh, this is what we care more about is the emission. Uh, and also the meteorology factors, uh, which will also influence the CO2 concentration and the geographic factor. Uh, we input all the 
variable as a favor into the model, uh, gonna train the model uh, to get a, 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 a label uh, as a concentration. So this is our setting for training and testing. So we divide our data set into 10 shares, and nine for training and one for test. And uh, we choose Adam W optimization as opti optimizer uh, uh, module. And uh, the learning rate set from uh, 0 0.001 and have a, gonna have a linear decay. And we use uh, random, randomly chopped uh, uh, mod, uh, uh, or tooth and to enhance the model's ability in domain transfer. And also uh, we, uh, we training uh, use the log function as NFE. So after hundreds of uh, ECOS uh, trainings, we got very good performance uh, for both surface concentration and color concentrations. And the RMFE is close to uh, one ppm. Uh, I think the value is pretty good because consider the baseline concentration of CO2 is around uh, 400. Okay, and let's look at the spatial distribution of the CO2 concentrations. Uh, this is the, the comparison between the NN predict concentration uh, with the CMAX simulated concentration. Uh, in the middle is the Wolfcam Wolf, Wolf model simulation, and on the right column is the RefNet predict concentration. And the first, first, first line is the surface, and the bottom, bottom is the column. So basically, you can see that the NN predict uh, concentration is very close uh, to the Wolfgang simulate concentration. So can pretty uh, good uh, consistency. And also we can see that the model can capture some high spot area uh, that is close to the anthropogenic sources. Uh, we emit a safe emission sources, uh, including the high uh, 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 Yangtze River Delta and southern uh, east uh, South China. And also the column concentration, the model also can capture that. The difference is that column, column concentration don't have much uh, gradients, uh, spatial gradients, because they can, uh, the CO2 can uh, get well mixed uh, with the atmosphere and uh, transfer across the space. So basically the gradients in column concentration uh, is smaller, but the model still can capture that, uh, and you can show in, you can see that the high concentration captured uh, for the southern east China and also India. Okay, and uh, another advantage of the uh, NN model over the traditional uh, numerical model is that it has a very efficient calculations because we can set up very easily to predict the uh, result. And uh, this is what we do, like we can modu uh, mod uh, modulate, change the input into the model and to see how the response, uh, how, the, how the concentration change due to the um, modulation of the input. So this is called sensitivity analysis uh, because the uh, N model is kind of like a box, a black box. So we want to know of the, the scientific uh, uh, behind the result. All right, and this result is actually represent how we are changing the input fa factor, which means uh, they have emissions and meteorologies, and we uh, changing, we reducing the value for each factor, and to see how the concentration change due to the change due to the reduction. So um, the results showing pretty interesting. Uh, at the bottom, you can see that there are really large contributions from the initial conditions, which means they have really long lifetime for because of the carbon dioxide have really long lifetime. So initial conditions play a very important role uh, for the simulate companies of lifetime step. And besides that, they can also, if we zoom into the other factors, the temperature also play a very important role. And we can also pick up the emission change uh, through the result, which is showing the brown color. And that is, uh, if you're reducing the emission, you're gonna reduce concentration. That doesn't also make sense. Uh, that's uh, uh, consistent to our uh, scientific knowledge about the uh, CO2 processes. And this result showing about the column concentration is pretty similar to the previous slide. And you can see that uh, the initial conditions still play a very important role and even bigger than the surface. And also in summertime and in the middle of the summertime, actually you can also pick up some uh, the biogenic activities, uh, including the uh, absorption of the carbons. And if you're reducing the absorption and the concentration will be enhanced. Uh, this also been captured by the NN model, uh, which is good. And we can uh, see that the NN model really predict a reliable result uh, for this uh, CO2 processes.
And we can do further analysis, like because we want to control the emission in the future, so how the concentration change to respond to the, to the reductions. So this figure showing you uh, the both surface and column concentration response to the reduction of the increase of the emission sources. Uh, in the first line, it's the anthropogenic emission, and the bottom is the biogenic absorption. Because biogenic activity, you kind of like a sink for you to kind of absorb carbon. And then if you're reducing the biogenic absorption, they're going to enhance the concentration. But if you're reducing the biogenic absorption, they're going to reduce uh, the carbon. So basically, you can see that the positive correlation due to the emission with concentration and the negative correlation between biogenic absorption with the concentration. So the model successfully captures that linearity uh, and uh, uh, give very good result. And, and if you think how the column concentration change uh, due, to, uh, due to the reduction of emission and the uh, biogenic absorption, you got a similar result. Um, but the difference is that uh, column concentration actually can spread a lot across the space. So you can also see some response in the rural area and the oceans. And however, the column concentration, if you, you can also pick up some high spot in the space, like uh, close to the sources. Uh, this also gives us some confidence that like we actually can also observe some signal uh, if we're reducing the emission, we also can see that from the column concentration because column concentration is directly related to the site light. And so that means we can observe that change uh, from the site light. Okay, I think uh, this is uh, our preliminary result and uh, uh, we're still working on it in the, in the next few uh, months. So hopefully we can get it submitted soon. And uh, they have some take home message and uh, to summary like the, our model can well reproduce the thick uh, wolf can model and can very well uh, predict the field of concentration from the input data like emission and the meteorology data. And it's able to predict the relationship uh, between the concentration and the field two flux and uh, can help us to explore the change of the concentration uh, which means the response to different uh, emission scenarios and can also be further used uh, to infer the dynamic field to flux because we have observation data, they can also use it to infer us, okay, if we have seen the observation change for how the emission change from that, we can also infer that information uh, for using that model. So use that information, we can help the local agency to evaluate the control effectiveness and design more effective control strategy uh, to achieve like, carbon peak and carbon neutrality. All right, I think that's all for today, and thank you for listening. And this work was supported by the MFIA project. And if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email at xinjia at tsinghua.edu.cn. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to attend this event to introduce or collaborate with Microsoft. My research topic and the presidential topic is about the real-time monitor of the global CO2 emission and the negative carbon accounting. So first, I want to thank our Microsoft team, like Microsoft Research Asia, including the Microsoft Machine Learning Group members of the members listed name on the here. And also, I want to thank our Tsinghua team, uh, our Tsinghua PhD students and the postdocs and the visiting students who have contributed a lot on this project. So we know right now we have the two main global challenges. The first one is a climate change, and the second one is a COVID pandemic. Those two challenges have its features. For the COVID pandemic, we see the dynamics of the new cases every day. For example, we have more than 500,000 cases in September 11 this year. For the CO2 emission, we really on, rely on the data, but we only have the data for years. We don't have the data like what we have for the COVID, for the, for the dynamics of the emissions every day. And also the CO2 emission have the delay of the reporting of the data from months to years. The discovery of the climate change issue is based on the pioneering work from the scientist Charles David Keeling 
that first calculate and measured the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And such kind of a data, the CO2 concentration data has been reported every day based on the equipment and the measurements. So this is a kind of near real-time data. But what we, if we look at the CO2 emissions, the CO2 that really contributed by the human activities, we cannot measure it directly. We cannot measure it with equipment, uh, with uh, different technologies. We can only calculate it based on the modeling, based on the data and the calculation process and also the statistic. So this leaves us a big challenge on how to report the living data, how to report the real-time data on the carbon emissions. The reason why we cannot directly measure the CO2 emission data is because the CO2 emission data is the only part of the global carbon budget resources that some kind of emission data, some kind of CO2 emission generated by human activities actually being uptaked by the natural resources. So we need to look at those, uh, uh, if we look at the CO2 concentration in the air, we actually look at the mixed data, the mixed uh, information contributed by the human activities and also the natural resources. And the re this result in the only res available data of the CO2 emission usually have the time lag for more than one year. It's look like uh, what we have is look like uh, if we, like we drive a car and we only look behind but we do not look in front, so we neglect the real challenges facing us. This is what the so-called quite requirement, the needs of the real-time data. So here, my research group have collaborated with Microsoft Research Asia to look at the near real-time data and the near real-time negative carbon accounting project called the NCC. Through this project, we want to build the methodologies and the technologies and the generated data that can capture the near real-time dynamics of global carbon emissions and the carbon sources and things. So we will use multiple sources of data including the satellite methodology, including the GIS and GPS, and also the data sources from the electricity grid and the statistic. And based on the machine learning technology and also the cloud computing technology, we could generate the model that will capture such dynamics. Such kind of a data sets and this modeling were contributed by the territorial carbon data, the ocean carbon data, and also the anthropogenic carbon emission data. So basically, the, both the natural carbon model and the anthropogenic carbon model will be in, included in such methods. And the first product of this project is so-called the Carbon Insights. It's a, for, it's a platform that generated the near real-time carbon emissions and the carbon sinks based on our, our calculation. It also provides us each nations and those, uh, uh, regions with different sectors and with very high resolution, including those uh, emission by sectors and by the different uh, energy sources. Here is an example of the ocean carbon data that we have, like uh, based on the, our technology, we have this natural submodel of the ocean carbon model. And also we have this territory carbon model that have this natural resources, what's the carbon uptake by the end carbon sink. And especially I want to introduce this anthropogenic submodel, the near real-time carbon emission model that we have to have this whole carbon emission data from, for the near real-time basis with daily value. So basically, if we look at the carbon emission by human activities, we can simply classify them into several contributors. 
especially the industrial activities, the power generation, the residential consumption, and the transportation, including the ground transportation, and transportation and the shipping. And through this regime, we could look at the data, we find that actually such kind of information can be connected by different data sources, especially those data with a real-time basis. For example, the GPS of the cars can help us to generate the CO2 emission of the trans ground transportation. And also, also we can connect it with, the, for example, each individual flights, the each uh, individual shipping line, and also the natural gas pipeline, and so on, and also such as grid power generation. And based on the machine learning technology, we have molded this data to make it a high resolution data set. This including the inventory technology and also economic method and also the uh, other technologies together to have this interdisciplinary research. So the result has first published in Nature Communications to introduce the daily value, the daily value of the CO2 emission in, 2000, uh, in 2020. And we also generated this website called the Carbon Monitor to show the real di dynamics of the CO2 emission for the each day. So if we look at the CO2 emission data from the other data set, currently we have this emission data for almost 250 years. Yeah. But this is because this is based on annual basis data set, so they only have this so much of the emission data. But if we have the daily value, the daily CO2 emission data, we have the CO2 emission for each day, just for one year, the volume of the data, the information of the data already much larger than what we have for the almost 200 and 300 years. And such kind of information will help us to review, to uncover the impacts of the events such as COVID-19. So if people ask the what's the impact of the CO2 emission on COVID-19? And we can simply answer the question based on this data set. Such kind of a new monitor of the CO2 emission revealed that says actually COVID-19 has the impact of about 7% decrease of the global CO2 emissions. And you see that most of the decline of the emission are happened yeah, in the beginning of the 2020 but has been slightly decreased uh, uh, year after. And such data set also can provide us special information. You see that this indicated what's the location of the biggest sources of the emission. For example, the power generation, the power factors, factories, the power factories uh, around the globe. And also the industrial activities, those industrial workshops, around the globe, and also the household uh, consumption. And those household consumption reveals the intensity of the household consumption of natural gas. And also, this information can reveal like what's the intensity, what's the emission from the ground transportation, and from the each cars, for example, from each cars. And here, that's like those kind of intensity of the cars on the, on the road. So it's a road map, it reveals the intensity of the emission from the, from, from the map. It also reveals like what's the aviation, what's the flight track, and it indicated what the emission sources from the aviation sectors, and also the shipping sectors around the globe. So it gives us a lot of information compared with other uh, previous uh, data set. And we see for the first time also the dynamics of CO2 emission for cities in a daily basis. So you see that each day there are the different values for CO2 emission in cities. And there is a huge difference of the weekday and the weekends of the emission. And such emission are even relocated in, in the cities especially. 
and uh, some cities will have uh, like emission more concentrated with its central areas. Some cities are not. They have uh, like more emission concentrated in the, for example, in their industrial areas. And we see like those kind of emission declines, the dynamics of CO2 emission uh, have uh, like contributed by different sectors. For example, the uh, uh, ground transportation and aviation sectors has been affected mostly during the pandemic, and uh, it haven't recovered yet. But if we look at the power sector and uh, the industrial sector, we see that the emission have already gradually recovered uh, with the level compared with last year. And also, the, in addition to the COVID pandemic, such kind of a near real time monitor of CO two emission also reviewed the impact of the other events, such as holidays, such as the seasonal cycles, seasonal variations. For example, we see like both China and the US because they're big country located in the North Hemisphere. And then we see those emissions in the winter actually a bit larger than the emission in the summer, uh, in, in, in the spring and autumn. And, but there is also the higher emission in summer because of the cooling uh, cooling degree and this, this cooling resource needed for the energy. And also, we say like the holidays also have a huge impact on the daily CO2 emission. For example, the lowest day of the CO2 emission in US is actually the Christmas. And also, the similarly, the lowest day in China is the Spring Festival and also the national holiday. And uh, such kind of uh, data set also very sensitive. For example, the left figure show like uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, the CO2 emission of the ground transportation in Beijing has decreased dramatically and it has recovered uh, gradually back to the normal level. But if there's a new case has been funded in Beijing, we see another wave of the uh, emission decline. This has been vivid and very precisely captured by the, by the data set. Similar results can be found in the other regions. For example, the different waves of the, of the pandemic have resulted in the decline of the emission in France and also in the United Kingdom. And the higher, more higher resolution data, for example, if we look at the hourly basis of the CO2 emission, the hourly basis of emission also reviewed this kind of a change of the human behavior. For example, look at those one day, just a one day, the CO2 emission in one day, there are two uh, peaks, uh, the morning peak and the, the evening peak of the CO2 emission because uh, most of people uh, go for the work and have a, a more energy use during that time. But during the COVID and after the COVID pandemic, we see like more people have this leisure time and this working time are not uh, so concentrated in a certain time. So there is a flattened effect of this peak, uh, peak time of the energy and also they have also flattened the, the peak of the CO2 in one day. So that's the result in the change of the human behavior. So our data set has been widely used. For example, the Nature have reported our data two times already. Uh, just in one year, we have a, the data has been used as a global carbon project, uh, the report on global carbon budget 2020, and also has been adopted by the national, uh, by the United Nations Emission Gap Report 2020. Here, we, I would just uh, show such information to let you know that those, such kind of real time data could be a new land to find. So we think like previously we look at those data, we do the research based on the historic data. And right now, it's a time to look at the real time data. It's time to look at the real time monitor. So I hope like our collaboration with Microsoft Asia Lab could contribute this and could generate a whole new regime for the researchers and academia and the public to look at What's the what's the challenge facing us, and to help us to uh, contribute us to fighting with the climate change and other challenges facing us. Here is my presentation, and thank you very much. I hope you 
If you have any questions, please let me know, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kuldeep Mil. I'm a faculty at National University of Singapore. I'll be discussing our project on forest fire prediction in the developing world. This is joint work with Suve Yang, who is my PhD student, and our collaborator Massimo Lupascu from Department of Geography. Well, we are here in Singapore, next to Indonesia, which is home to 23% of world's total tropical peatlands. Peatlands, as uh, some of you are aware, are the largest natural terrestrial carbon store. And they do look very beautiful, these forests. You are welcome to visit when you are here in this part of the world. But if you have been following the news, the past few years have not been very kind to the uh, peatland forests. We have seen devastating fires that required authorities to scramble resources at the last minute to contain them. And these fires, despite the best effort of the authorities, have left devastating effect on the ecosystem lying there. In particular, these fires in 2015 emitted nearly 16 million tons of carbon dioxide a day. To put that in the context, that is more than the daily emissions from the entire U.S. economy. They have left long effects, ill effects on the health. One of the recent studies indicated that 30% of children living in the locality of uh, these areas have respiratory diseases and growth inhibition. And not only that, all of us were aware of the sad images of the orangutans who were dealing with the loss of their habitat. And those were just some of one of the few images that led to loss of biodiversity at a scale that would be hard to reason with in uh, decades to come. In light of these effects, the need for action is higher than ever. But as I mentioned, this is the developing part of the world, and economy detect economy that uh, <clears throat> impacts the sort of actions we can take. In particular, if one has to rely on the existing state of art systems, such as Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System, then the deployment of these uh, systems is very expensive and uh, not feasible, uh, given the financial constraints. So what is really needed? Well, we need a cost-effective and at the same time an accurate prediction of where the fires are going to happen so that at least the local authorities can perform efficient allocation of their resources. To achieve this, we took a path less traveled, which was to build the, try to use the data as much as possible from uh, the that does not require de uh, deployment of sensors on the ground and in particular, I'm discussing about the remote sensing data. And our project focuses on uh, using the advances that have happened in machine learning over the past few decades to be able to combine with the remote sensing data. And in order to allow sufficient time for deployment of uh, resources, we predict forest fires five weeks into the future. So in particular, if we are today, then we would like to predict whether there will be a fire in the fifth week from now, so a month from now, that would hopefully allow authorities to perform efficient allocation of the required resources. I'll give a quick glimpse about how we have been building our system so far and then leave with you 
um, thoughts on where do we go from here. Just to recap what we want to do, we would like to predict the uh, confidence or the probability of a fire happening in the fifth week from now. So this is, if we are here today, then we are uh, trying to predict the fire in, the, uh, in a month from now. To make these prediction happen, we had to rely on the data. And in particular, we, our view is to rely on the historical data coming from the remote sensing. And in our system, at this point, we rely on the data from the past one year. The data comes from mainly the satellite images of the Landsat 7. And the labels are based on uh, the firm's hotspot data that has been collected from various uh, sources over the past uh, few decades. Here is how the Landsat 7 spectral bands look like. As you can see, there are different bands that try to target different uh, wavelengths and have different resolution. So there, are, of course, arises challenges in combining the uh, data with different resolution and, uh, of course, different wavelengths. Once we get this uh, satellite data, the next is to assign the labels for each of the spots to be able to train whether there was a fire or not. And we collect the hotspot data from various satellite sources each of these detections often has a confidence level between 0 and 100%. Um, from technical perspective, we do the binarization for uh, training and evaluation of these uh, data points. Let me discuss some of the aspects about a data preparation because um, the Practical implementation of machine learning systems often re require a lot of time that is really spent on uh, data preparation. In our case, once we retrieve the ref reference satellite image, the image is large. So we combine the image with the firm's label, but then we slice the image into an 8 cross 8 uh, kilometer area. The images would require a large memory to store and would be infeasible if we want a system that can continuously evolve. So we perform a compression where we take the satellite images and we convert them to histograms. Once we, once we have the uh, data, then one of the challenges that we had to handle was that this data that we had uh, would be incomplete. In particular, two challenges uh, that came to, in our context, was the imperfect satellite orbit. So during um, every orbit, the Landsat 7 often misses out some of the areas. And the other, aspect, other issue is that, well, these are the real systems um, up in the atmosphere, Sometimes some of the instruments uh, do get damaged. In particular, for Landsat 7, the scan line calibrator has been damaged. So we get this data that has some of uh, the data labels and areas missing. So for this, we had to deal with some of the technical challenges of missing data. Well, let's see how well our system can perform. We performed on the data from 2014 to 2018. So this is what we did the training on. And then we did the evaluation on um, months from June to September 2019. As is standard, in order to interpret these results, we look at the AUC curve. Just to make sure all of us are on the same page, what we are looking for is that given the past one year's historical data, can we predict the confidence of fire happening in the fifth week from now? So in a month from now, can we predict if there would be a fire at a given uh, spot? 
how well the system works. This current state of the art standard baseline models would be able to get to the AUC of about 0.7 and Agni can achieve AUC somewhere between 0 0.81 um, to 85, so a significant increase being able to rely on the remote sensing data and the combination of uh, the machine learning techniques and that we employ in our work. This increase is significant, especially has been encouraging to our partners. And this is where I would like to conclude by mentioning that combining remote sensing data and machine learning seems to be crucial for a cost-effective solution which becomes paramount in a developing world. Where do we go from here? Well, just building the system is not sufficient. We need to work towards the deployment, so we are looking for partners for deployment, in particular deployment at a large scale in our view would require development of systems. We envision development of a mobile app Having the mobile app would also allow us to collect more data about the temperature, real-time data about the temperature from different sources and other sensors um, that one can have, which in our view would allow us to uh, do a continuous model improvement because now that we have access to more uh, data that would uh, come in with the deployment. So with that, I would like to say there is a lot of exciting challenges for a problem that is really important. And I would be very excited to discuss further. I hope uh, to talk to some of you during the rest of the summit. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, I'm Toru Sato from University of Tokyo. Today, I will talk about offshore CO2 storage in the form of gas hydrate. This is the agenda of my talk today. Expectation of CCS in Japan, challenges of CCS in Japan, CO2 storage in the form of gas hydrate. Concluding remarks. First, expectation of CCS in Japan. Last year, Prime Minister Suga declared carbon neutral in 2050. And this year, he also declared 46% reduction in CO2 emission in 2030 in G7 Climate and Environment Minister's meeting. Right figure shows that the composition of power supply in 2030, estimated in this year actually, by the government. You see, red part is the hydrocarbon. So 46% of power supply is still hydrocarbon. So we need to do the uh, CO2 emission from this hydrocarbon. CCS is the one of the solution for that. CCS is the abbreviation of carbon dioxide capture and storage. CCS is captured from the exhaust gas in fire plant, then stored in an offshore aquifer under the cap rock, which is a permeable, impermeable layer. The important thing is CCS is a bridging technology towards new green world, so which is probably comes in the second half of this century. There are many challenges of CCS in Japan. 
But today, I pick up two of them, leakage risk and storage capacity. As you know, Japan has many earthquakes. If a big one strikes the impermeable caprock, CO2 may leak through the fracture of the caprock towards the seawater. Then the right figure shows that the effect of high CO2 concentration in seawater on the sea urchin lava. At this moment, atmospheric CO2 concentration is 400 ppm. That is the control case on the left-hand side. The second one is plus five, 500 ppm, means that total 900 ppm. Sea urchin lava has already has difficulty to grow. So plus 500 ppm is kind of dangerous zone. We did numerical simulations, actually large scale simulations of CO2 fate in the ocean. The middle figure says that the, in the case of leakage rate of 90,000 ton per year, the vertical axis is the delta PCO2, means additional PCO2. So as I said, five, 500 ppm is a kind of dangerous zone for sea urchin lava. So if you think about the safety ratio, 200 ppm may be a kind of threshold. So sometimes CO2 concentration exceeds this threshold 200 ppm in the case of 90,000 ton per year leakage rate. But 90,000 ton per year is almost similar scale to the one big volcano like Sakurajima in Kagoshima prefecture in Japan. It's too large. The right figure shows that leakage rate of 3,000 ton per year case. The additional CO2 concentration is about several ppm. This is actually within the natural fluctuation. So we can say that it's safe. So the ocean environment depends on the leakage rate. But we call it the uh, left-hand side case is moderate case. Actually, Japan has already conducted offshore CO2 storage project off Tomakomai in Hokkaido. They stored CO2 of 0.1 million ton per year for three years. Now I'll talk about another challenges of CCS which is storage capacity. Annual emission of CO2 from coal power plant is currently 0.2 gigaton. After the close of 100 all type coal plants within these 10 years, at least 0.1 gigaton CO2 per year must be store, stored. In the case of 1 million ton scale storage, we need hundreds of uh, uh, storage sites. One million ton scale storage is 10 times larger than Tomakomai case. Right, right figure shows that the storage capacity near seashore. This is drawn by my student and he said that uh, the storage capacity is enough to store one million ton, oh, sorry, 0, 0 0.1 gigaton for 30 years. However, he didn't consider active faults and also local public acceptance. To expand the storage capacity, there's 
one option for us. Go further offshore. Then the right figure says that we can have storage capacity almost the same as the near seashore. If you go further offshore, the water becomes deeper and pressure becomes high and temperature becomes low. Then what we will have is gas hydrate. CO2 hydrate is expected to suppress the leakage. Then CO2 storage in the form of gas hydrate. Do you know what the hydrate is? Have you heard about methane hydrate? Methane gas molecule is trapped in a cage of water molecules. This is gas hydrate, methane hydrate. And the shape is quite look like ice. It's a solid structure and it's very safe. It doesn't dissolve if the temperature and the pressure doesn't, don't change. To know how hydrate can stop CO2 flow, permeability is an important parameter. The permeability depends on the hydrate, how hydrate exists in the pore space of sandy sediment. Then we did the simulation of hydrate formation within the pore space of sand layers in the microscopic computational domain. First, we did CT scan of sand layer. Second, we reproduce the sand grains virtually in a cyberspace. Then we packed the virtual sand grains in a computational domain, which edge length is about 200 micrometer. Fourth, we flew two phases of CO2 and water to form hydrate. So this is the how hydrate forms within the pore space of sand grains. Now we can calculate the permeability in the microscopic domain with hydrate. Finally, we are trying to simulate the CO2 flow and the hydrate formation within much, much larger scale, hundreds of meter scale. Again, we need multi-scale simulation. However, the scale difference between micro scale and hundreds meter scale are very large. If micros microscopic simulations are called at every time step, at every computational cell of the large scale simulation, it will be extremely time consuming and almost impossible to calculate. Here we have come to an idea that Deep learning may solve this problem. Once we train neural networks using a tons of numerical results of micro scale simulations in advance, then in the large scale simulation, we only differ to the neural network outputs. Actually, this is the project we are collaborating with Microsoft Research at this moment. Concluding remarks, commercialization of CCS is coming soon in Japan as a bridging technology towards green energy world. There are challenges to use CCS, such as suppression of leakage risk and expansion of storage capacity 
going further offshore is a promising option. In the case of deep water underground storage, CO2 hydrate can suppress the leakage. A multi-scale numerical simulation is a powerful tool to predict the seeding effect of CO2 hydrate, and deep learning can be a powerful tool to couple small and large-scale simulations. A large number of poor-scale hydrate formation simulations have been conducted, and tons of permeability reduction data have been accumulated for the training of neural networks at this moment. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Xinran Wei, a researcher from Macro Research Asia. Today, I will introduce our recent work on low carbon transformation pathway for China's coal power plant. Climate changes have become one of the most crucial global challenges for human beings. To mitigate its impact, many countries around the world have their goals and the corresponding path towards carbon neutrality in order to keep the average temperature rise within 1. Point degrees Celsius. Among them, China has pledged that its carbon emissions should peak by 2030 and then decline, with the goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, this is really a ratio decarbonization plan. To achieve this target, it is necessary to vigorously transform coal power plants since they produce more than 40% of the total carbon emissions in China. In reality, there exist multiple options of processing coal power plants. Of course, the more reckless way is to directly shut down them. However, it will cause great economic loss since the total capacity of all coal power plants in China has exceeded 1.1 billion kilowatts, and many of them have had unit efficiency and are on average 30 years from normal retirement. In the meantime, the technologies of renewable energy have not been mature enough to provide adequate and stable replacement to those produced by coal power plants. For example, the wind and the solar power usually suffer from intermittent and uh, fluctuating supply, and there also exists big uncertainty of developing the technology of hydrogen power generation and the storage. Therefore, under both economic and technical considerations, a more reasonable way is to pursue technical transformation of coal power plants. There actually exist multiple options of technology transformation that are suitable for different conditions of coal power plants. Bioenergy and the carbon capture and the storage are two typical ones. Particularly, bioenergy is a biomass coal combustion technology that can adjust amounts of biomass collection and the corresponding cost through tuning coal combustion ratios. It is usually applied in existing power stations infrastructure. While CCS refers to the technology of capturing carbon dioxide before it enters the atmosphere, it is usually installed on uh, new coal power plants, especially those with less surrounding biomass resources. BECCS is a combination of bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. This technical route can achieve negative carbon, while the above two can only achieve zero carbon. The mixed combustion ratios in BCCS can also be adjusted. There are still another two options, including taking no action or a direct retirement. The latter one is more suitable for those outdated coal power plants. 
In order to pick the most appropriate transformation option, it is also necessary to take into account a few other important factors, including the distribution of biomass resource, cost and the pollution caused by material transportation, technical selection of coal power plants, and the availability of carbon dioxide storage sets. The designate the transformation plan for all coal power plants, we have to address a couple of key challenges. First, in a fast developing world, transformation technology may keep being upgraded and consequently biomass fuel prices, renovation costs, storage costs may keep dropping. It requires a sequential decision-making process for the coal power plant transformation rather than one-time shot. Take the power plant in the right picture as an example. It is very likely that from 2025 to 2035, the technology adopted will gradually develop from BE to BECCS, and its share will continue to go. Moreover, since each individual plant may apply diverse combination of technologies, it largely increases the action space of the transformation plan so that uh, to the difficulty of making an appropriate plan. Furthermore, since there are relatively a large amount of power plants in China, the scale of the solution space is also large plus the imbalanced distribution of biomass resource between different regions. It requires an effective and efficient method to coordinate computation among different coal power plants. To solve this problem, we introduce a two-step approach. The first step is to predict the future coal power demand and the aging of coal power plant equipment. Among them, the future GDP, population, land change, extra are considered in the forecast of coal power demand. And the evaluation of power equipment is related to humidity because its metal parts are more likely to corrode under high humidity. Following it, the second step uses nonlinear programming to optimize the low carbon transformation path of China's coal power plants, meaning to identify which technology each power plant should use to meet its cost and emission targets. And how much biomass we should collect to spot this uh, technology in such a complete system. This optimization process also includes several critical constraints that reflect the, the relationship between biomass resources distribution, transportation demand, coal power plant conditions, and technology selection. To reach the ultimate goal of carbon neutrality at minimum cost, we designed the objective function consisting of two parts reflecting cost and the carbon emissions respectively. And the calculations of them are both affected by the uh, transportation process and the power generation process. The cost as an example, the transportation cost is mainly determined by the distance of biomass transportation and the number of vehicles required for transportation. The cost of Power generation is mainly affected by the transformation technology we choose, the scale of the power plant, and the ratio of mixed combustion. Among them, the condition of equipment is also affected by the degree of humidity. Based on this, we predict the equipment parameters of different years, which will also affect the calculation of the loss function. We further model important conditions into four types of constraints. The first type reflects the certain order of technology transition in the sense that the technology evolution should be consistent with social development. For example, 
uh, Bell Energy can only be converted to BECCS, but not vice versa. The second tab attempts to control the transportation cost and the pollution cost by the coal power plants by limiting the geographical range each power plant can reach for collecting biomass resource. Another type of constraint is used to ensure that the total biomass each resource supplies for all plants should be less than its own reserves. This actually reflects the competition of resources among multiple coal power plants. In addition, we introduce a demand fulfillment constraint to guarantee that the power generation of all power plants should always meet the future power demand. To evaluate the effectiveness of our proposed methods, we simulate the optimization process over 137 coal power plants in Anhui province of China. The figure on the right shows the output transformation plans of various coal power plants in Anhui province in 2030. Each dot on the figure represents a coal power plant and the different colors represent different transformation plans. According to the output plan, 40% of power plants have undergone BE retrofits and 20% of the power plants have undergone BECCS retrofits, while the others bear no change. More excitingly, we found our transformation pathway can reduce 100% uh, of coal power plants carbon emission with only 10% increment of electrical valence. The reduced carbon emission is equivalent to about 75% uh, of total emission by the whole Anhui province. Hi everyone, I'm Shu Xin Zheng from Microsoft Research Asia. But today, I'd like to share the recent progress of our work, the GraphFormer, which could be the AI model to carbon removal. In fact, we emit CO2 every day, not only in the factory, but also in our daily life, such as driving, taking elevator, or even breath. The emitted CO2 in the atmosphere uh, will raise the global temperature due to the greenhouse effect. This is because the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere will block the reflected sunlight from the ground and then uh, reflect it back to, again to the ground and to continually uh, raise the global temperature. Now, let's imagine a problem. What will happen if we immediately shut down all the CO2 emission uh, globally? Will the temperature peak and then go flatten or gradually reducing? Uh, unfortunately, uh, it won't happen. Uh, it will still be rising, uh, but slightly uh, slow down. The reason is uh, very simple, uh, because there are already tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, it will not disappear for no reason and will be there forever. Therefore, we must figure out how to remove existing CO2 from the atmosphere. In fact, there are two traditional ways uh, plant trees or uh, physically absorb CO2 from the air but they are both inefficient. For example, uh, even if we plant uh, every piece of land, uh, we plant trees at every piece of land on the earth, uh, it still be far from enough to remove the CO2 in the uh, atmosphere. So we urgently need more efficient ways for carbon removal. Maybe the answer is the carbon removal catalyst. Imagine that if we could discover or invent a new uh, catalyst, uh, which could decompose CO2 to other useful matters. Then the global climate, ch uh, climate change disaster may be uh, largely mitigated. Okay, now our goal is very clear. Uh, we want to discover a new carbon removal catalyst uh, with uh, or uh, potentially uh, properties. Uh, how could we do? Uh, actually, not only catalyst uh, discovery, but also many important uh, uh, applications such as uh, clean energy, uh, mat material discovery, or new battery design, uh, they both face the same problem, uh, which is that we need to find the target uh, molecular which has favorite uh, properties we want. 
In fact, uh, many computation, uh, computational physics and chemical, uh, chemical uh, scientists study this problem. They call it molecular simulation. Uh, it aims to simulate the structure, the energy, and the behaviors and various properties of the molecular. Uh, there are two ways for molecular simulation. Uh, one is the uh, classical uh, mechanics, uh, which is relatively fast. Uh, but we all know that for the micro world, uh, the classical mechanics doesn't work. The other one is quantum uh, mechani mechanics. Uh, there are lots of uh, theory in the quantum mechanics uh, which could accurately uh, characterize the behaviors uh, and the properties for a uh, molecular, such as the density functional theory or the uh, molecular orbital theory. But it is uh, extremely slow. Uh, for example, for a small molecular with only nine items, it will take about uh, one hour to simulate the properties. So how could we handle billions of molecules with quantum mechanics? Therefore, in recent years, uh, scientists try to use machine learning technology to accelerate the molecular simulation. To be specific, using graph neural network, uh, aka GNN, uh, for modeling molecules is currently the best way. It can reduce the simulation time from hours to milliseconds and also could generalize to various properties. But today's GNN is quite limited. For example, we all know that today's artificial intelligence uh, is benefit from uh, big data and big model, such as the famous GPT-3, which is built upon a model called Transformer, has more than hundreds of billion parameters. But today's best GNN has less than 100 million parameters. Obviously, it has not enjoyed the benefit from big data and big model. Okay, we just mentioned the GPT-3 is built, for, uh, built upon a model called Transformer. Actually, today, Transformer has become the dominant choice on many uh, important tasks, such as uh, sequence data, uh, like natural language processing or speech recognition, or grid data, like image or uh, video processing. But for graph data, uh, especially for the molecular modeling, uh, which we care about most, uh, GNN is still the top one choice and gradually become the bottleneck in this area. Here, we try to ask uh, why not transformer could be applied to graph data. In fact, uh, many researchers attempt to use transformer on graph and uh, molecular modeling, but they fail. So why and what's the key problem? We try to figure out the reason of why Transformer successfully, uh, successfully used for sequence data and grid data. And finally, we found that the key insight is to encode the structure information into the Transformer model. For sequence data and grid data, the structure information is the positional information. And for graph, uh, it is more complicated. We need to consider the spatial position, the centrality, and the edge features as sufficient structure information for graph. Therefore, we invent graph, uh, graphformer model, which is a pure transformer model plus three uh, structural encodings. This simple yet effective model is quite powerful for molecular simulation tasks. So how powerful is graphformer? Here I try to give two theoretical facts. The first one is that today's a uh, mainstream GNN variants will fall into the special cases of our Graphformer model. This is because that by using the operations in Graphformer and let the, some learnable parameters be specific values, then this mainstream GNN variants could be recovered from Graphformer. And the second one is more interesting. Uh, Graphformer could distinguish many important structures or substructures of molecular, but GNN fails. For example, the left one, uh, the, uh, this uh, molecular is called natalie, and the right one is called biphenol. Although they look like very similar, but they have totally different properties. For example, the natalie is uh, cancerogenic, uh, genic, and the biphenol is toxic. If today's GNN could even not distinguish such structures, I think it may not still be ready for the real applications. 
with this graphomer model, we participate in a recent computation, the KDD Cup 2020, uh, 2021, which is focused on AI for simulation, uh, molecular simulation, and attracts many big companies and research labs in this area, including DeepMind. Particular in this computation, the scale of the data set is greatly larger than all previous computation and data sets, which makes it uh, become the first image net computation uh, in the graph learning area. And very lucky, uh, by using our graphomer model, uh, we win the first place of this computation by beating DeepMind and other big uh, companies. This demonstrates that we are indeed in the leading position in this important area. Finally, I want to stress that there will still be a room to improve uh, graphomer to the chemical accuracy. The chemical accuracy means that even doing chemical experiments in the lab could not guarantee the accuracy below this number. But we believe that the graphomer has huge potential to be the AI model to carbon removal and even more uh, other important applications. Thanks for very much for your watching.